Warning, this podcast is a Korea Black production. This is a podcast for adults only. It is not a podcast for people who think podcast hosts should be emotional friends, spiritual advisors, surrogate parents, or role models for their children, grandchildren, or potential offspring. This podcast may contain all sorts of trigger warning type content such as graphic language, harsh judgments, and microaggressive behavior. If you are a sensitive person or reality challenged, or you only listen to podcasts that agree with your religious views, personal philosophy, ideology, or feelings about life in general, please do not listen to this podcast. All comments, compliments, and complaints should be sent to koreablack at koreablackproductions.com. Thank you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. This is a line from T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wastelands. The line has several interpretations, but to me it pertains to the fallen state of the world at large. The fear is an ambiguous personification of the Dark Tower mythos. It's a representation of the tower, which dwells within the heart of a nexus point known as the 13th Gate. It not only rules Roland's world, but all worlds in existence. The handful of dust is what remains when the world moves on and mankind reaps what it has sown. There is a passage deep within this story that talks about a colony of bees and their hive being mutated by some unknown environmental event. The hive looks deformed in appearance, almost as if it were melting away due to the heat of the sun. The bees had fat, grotesque bodies and were snow white in color. They would fly around as if dazed and confused and unaware that their existence was coming to an end. I mention this passage because... It's a reflection of the withering away of the people of Midworld themselves. When the laws governing the world had collapsed, death and destruction eventually took root. Those who had survived the wars, disease, and famine wandered around aimlessly, scavenging through what was left behind from better days. Roland was a part of those better days, a gunslinger, which Midworld's modern society would generally believe was only a myth. But regardless of this, he instills the traditions of old in his new group of gunslingers called the Cotet. A quartet is a group of people that are bound by fate in order to accomplish a certain goal. Their goal is to reach the Dark Tower and somehow do away with the sickness and evil that has infected its domain. The Wastelands is not only a physical representation of Roland's story, but a psychological one as well. Roland is not a man who gives into self-analysis. He is a man of action who relies on brutal instinct and pragmatism to deal with whatever confronts him. But lately there have been moments when his tried and true inner workings feel as if they are failing him. There is something creeping its way through his mind, body, and soul. Something so foreign and mysterious that he's never faced it before. Something that he believes is pushing him to the edge of sanity. The root of the problem comes from the time he spent with Jake. Roland is dealing with conflicting memories and cannot determine which ones are true and which ones are false. He remembers traveling through the desert and mountains with Jake, which ultimately led to Jake falling to his death. But he also remembers making that same journey by himself and never meeting Jake at all. He knows they both happen but he can only believe one of them to be real. This schism between the warring factions of his mind is what's causing him severe waves of mental anguish. But before he can delve further into his internal civil war, he and his new band of gunslingers are attacked by a giant 70-foot-tall bear named Shardik. Shardik is a cybernetic beast created by the Old Ones. He is one of the 12 guardians of the beam that hold up the Dark Tower. But most people who have experienced this hybrid creation call him Mir. Mir means the world beneath the world. Because to them, he was a demon incarnate or the shadow of God. And like most things in this world, either as a result of age, malfunction, or disease, Shardik is dying. And like Roland, is also going insane. After Shardik is defeated, Roland stands before the massive bear so he can verify what he only believed to be a children's story. Roland saw Shardik as a relic from the days of old. A creature that once protected the foundation of the world itself, now lay dead at the gunslinger's feet. 
It was oozing blood, oil, and yellow pus filled with little parasitic white worms. The world had moved on, and this time it left behind the rotting corpse of Shardik the Great. There is an interesting comparison that Roland is apparently unable to see. Had he possessed the gift of introspection, he would have realized the very monster he towers over like a conquering hero is also a freakishly similar version of himself. Both of these beings are considered defenders of the realm that created them, and both of them are forces of nature that serve a higher power. And because of this, they each suffer under the tremendous weight of that power's might and will. And even though they are very different as far as the form they inhabit, they are exactly the same in regards to the effect that the rigors of life and time are doing on their well-being. One has already fallen to the hand of fate, and the other is oblivious to the fact that that same hand will one day come for him as well. And as I said before, introspection is a gift Roland does not possess. When it's all said and done, the success or failure of his journey can be traced back to the lack of that gift. As the story continues, Roland, Eddie, and Susanna have been following the path of the beam for eight days. During one of their rest periods, Roland confesses to Eddie that he thinks he's getting ready to die. And if he does die, he hopes he'll finally be free of the voices inside of his head so he can hear nothing but utter silence. The voices are ripping Roland's mind apart, and he thinks the only cure for his madness is death. Eddie tells Roland he is making something that he believes will end his suffering. Eddie is carving a key out of a chunk of wood, but what the key will open he does not know. But Eddie does feel this is part of the solution to Roland's problem. Eddie believes this because he received a message from Jake while he was sleeping. Jake told Eddie, if Roland grabs the key, the key will make the voices go away. And even though Roland told Eddie that Jake was dead, Eddie believes Jake may still be alive in another world and sent him the message in order to help Roland. So Eddie gives Roland the key and tells Roland to keep it with him. Once Roland touches the key, there is a quick glimmer of light, almost like starlight, running along the body of the key. And then Roland yells up at the sky, the voices are gone, and then begins to cry. The mental torment that had run rampant throughout his mind had withdrawn into nothingness. After several days of travel, Roland, Eddie, and Susanna come upon a speaking ring. It's similar to the one Roland and Jake had come across back in the mountains. This particular speaking ring is how Eddie believes Jake will return to Midworld, but Roland felt the need to warn Eddie and Susanna that speaking rings are where demons dwell, and demons will try to kill anyone who trespass into their domain. As the story progresses, the Cotet was successful in creating a door to bring Jake back into Midworld. Jake asked Roland, you won't let me drop this time? And Roland responds by saying, no, not this time, not ever again. The story goes on by saying that within the deepest darkness of Roland's heart, he thought of the tower and wondered. The meaning behind this is that if push comes to shove and Roland has to choose between Jake and the tower again, Roland will probably choose to let Jake die. Side note, I understand that for most of y'all, this wouldn't be a popular decision, but I'm looking at it from Roland's point of view. The man is trying to save his world from falling into oblivion, and because of this, he's willing to sacrifice a few in order to save the many, and possibly turn back the hands of time in order to undo what happened to his beloved Gilead long ago. I think if I were in his position, I would probably do the exact same thing. This isn't like one of those silly superhero stories where you know the protagonist will go on a formulaic hero journey so he or she can fight whatever the PG-13 monster of the week is in order to fulfill some dumbass requirements for a generic redemption arc, just so everybody can laugh, smile, and get a reach around at the end of the movie. No, this is the story of a broken man trying to save a dying world, and if he has to sacrifice the life of a child, his quartet, or a thousand other souls to do it, then that's what the man's gonna do. The reason I love the Dark Tower series, and stories like it, is because it's about realistic people making incredibly hard decisions that may or may not be the right one and the choice they made was the necessary choice at the time they made it. That speaks more to the integrity of the writer than the writer creating some heartwarming decision, just so the reader thinks Roland's a really good guy. Hard choices are called hard choices because they're fucking hard. This existence we call life was never meant to be easy, and it never will be, no matter what the circumstances we face. Anyway, four days after Jake returns to Midworld, he meets what Roland calls a Billy Bumbler. It's described as a combination of a raccoon, a woodchuck, and a little bit of a dachshund thrown in for good luck. Jake decides to name the Billy Bumble Oi, and Oi becomes the fifth member of the quartet. Eventually, Roland and company come across a town called River Crossing. 
It's a town that consists solely of elderly people, and because of their age, they still remember the last of the gunslingers. So when Roland enters the town, they are shown nothing but kindness and respect. Gunslingers were the policemen of their day before the world fell into anarchy, and to see one in the flesh was something people never thought they'd see again. As more and more people came out of their homes to meet Roland, we eventually meet the town leader named Aunt Talitha. She invites the gunslingers to dinner so they can talk and rest a while before going on their way. As everyone gets more acquainted, Aunt Talitha takes notice of Jake. This is due to the odd clothes he's wearing and the peculiar way he conducts himself. She asks where he's from, and Roland answers for him by saying, a far-off land. Then Aunt Talitha asks when he will return, and Jake replies by saying, never. Then he goes on to say he plans to live in Midworld for the rest of his life, and he has no intention of going back to his homeland. That's when a slight sign of sadness overcomes Aunt Talitha's face, and she responds by saying, God's pity you then, for the sun is going down on the world, it's going down forever. Once they have finished eating, Roland asks Aunt Talitha about a city called Lud. Roland wants to know all he can about the city because it's located on the path of the beam, and they will have to go through it in order to continue on with their quest. Aunt Talitha responds by saying that Roland should avoid Lud if possible, because it has fallen into ruin and what remains is controlled by evil men. Then we learn about a great civil war that took place almost 400 years ago that devastated several large cities and small towns throughout the region. Eventually, armies of the very sides of the war would break off from the smaller bands of raiders called Harriers. Harriers would rob, maim, and kill any and all people they would come across, and this caused civilization in this part of the world to fall into anarchy. We also learned that the war originally started between rural groups of outlaws and business owners within various cities, that the city dwellers decided to fight back against the looting and burning of their shops and homes, and this was the catalyst of all the death and destruction that was spread throughout the land. After several centuries of war, the rule of law had become a thing of the past, and now people were trying to survive the best way they knew how as the world continued to move on. Eventually, the gunslingers leave River Crossing and come across a treacherous-looking bridge. The bridge crosses over the River Sin and will take them into the city of Lud. As they're walking the length of the bridge, there are extremely strong winds making the journey even more hazardous than it needs to be. Suddenly, they see a man standing at the far end of the bridge watching them trying to cross. The man's name is Gasher. He's armed with a crossbow on his back and dressed similar to that of a pirate. His face looks haggard and sick due to purple open sores oozing small amounts of yellow pus and blood. Roland believes Gasher is in the late stages of a disease called Whore's Blossom. But despite the sinister look of the man, what makes him even more dangerous is the grenade he's holding in his right hand. Gasher tells Roland to hand over Jake or he'll detonate the grenade and kill everyone on the bridge. Gasher wants Jake so he can take him back to his boss, the TikTok man. So in order to save his friends, Jake decides to go with Gasher. Once Jake is within reach of Gasher, Gasher grabs Jake's arm and they run into a darkened alleyway. Roland tells Eddie he's going after Jake alone, and he needs Eddie and Susanna to go into the city and find the train known as Blaine the Mono. They need Blaine in order to cross over the perilous terrain of the wastelands. Realizing that both missions are equally important, Eddie and Susanna agree to Roland's request. As the story moves forward, we see Gasher and Jake finally reaching the subterranean lair of the TikTok man. The room is some sort of bomb shelter and contains about half a dozen people. Everyone in the room is there to serve the TikTok man. The TikTok man is a big, muscular man, almost reminiscent of a Viking warrior. He's sitting in a throne like chair with an old machine gun hanging from its side. Jake also notices that the TikTok man is wearing a coffin shaped glass box charm, which is hanging by a silver chain around his neck. Inside the glass box is a tiny gold pendulum that swings back and forth. The TikTok man starts asking Jake questions about his background and where he's from. While being questioned and beaten for any answer that the TikTok man doesn't like, Jake notices a ventilation shaft which encircles the room. He is interested in one particular section of the shaft because he sees a pair of gold ring eyes shining within the darkness. He knows those eyes belong to Oi and that help is on the way. Eddie and Susanna find the train known as Blaine the Mono. Its body was streamlined like a bullet and looked more like flesh than metal due to its surface color, which was a delicate shade of pink. Blaine was capable of speech, and soon after conversing with it, they realized that Blaine is a sort of ghost in the machine with a genius intellect and an insatiable hunger for riddles. But they also realized he is paranoid, schizophrenic, and probably delusional. We later find out that the TikTok man is questioning Jake, because he needs someone who's computer literate 
to be able to work on the thousands of computers underneath of the city. But Jake does not know if he can operate the computers, so the TikTok man believes that Jake is pretending to be stupid. Eventually, due to some quick thinking on Jake's part, Jake is able to turn the TikTok man against Gasher. As the TikTok man is about to beat Gasher, Oi drops down from a nearby ventilation shaft and starts biting and slashing the TikTok man's face. Oi tears out the TikTok man's left eye, and in response to this, the TikTok man grabs Oi and is about to rip him in half like a rag doll. Jake grabs the machine gun that was hanging from the TikTok man's chair and starts firing at the TikTok man, hitting him just above the left knee. When the TikTok man starts to come after Jake, Jake attempts to shoot him again. But the machine gun is either out of bullets or jammed, so Jake keeps moving back away from the TikTok man and falls into the TikTok man's chair. That's when Jake notices a handgun hidden in a small pocket of the chair's armrest. Jake grabs the gun and shoots the TikTok man again. The bullet hits the TikTok man on the right side of his forehead and part of his scalp falls onto his cheek. Then the TikTok man collapses face forward onto the floor. Jake tries to reach the podium where the buttons are located to open up the chamber door. But before he can hit any of the buttons, Gasher grabs Jake by the throat and drags him away. Roland is outside of the chamber door, desperately trying to figure out how to get into the room. Then suddenly the door opens. When Roland enters the room, he sees Oi attacking Gasher, while at the same time, Gasher is choking the life out of Jake. Gasher looks over at the entrance and sees Roland standing there. Roland fires his gun at Gasher, blowing off the left side of Gasher's head. Then Roland proceeds to kill the rest of the TikTok man's underling. Once all the killing is done, Blaine decides to make contact with Roland and Jake. Blaine wants to test their knowledge of riddles, so he has them follow a floating steel sphere, which leads them to where he is stationed. Now that the quartet has been reunited, Blaine announces to them that they need to board the train quickly because he is about to release a gas that will kill everyone in Lud. Eddie asks Blaine why he wants to murder an entire city. Blaine responds by saying he can't nuke the city without destroying himself, and if he was destroyed, he would not be able to take his latest group of travelers to where they need to go. Then Susanna continues to ask Blaine why he is doing this. Blaine responds by saying he is bored with the people of Lud, and he finds this newly formed quartet of gunslingers much more interesting. But Blaine also says that the gunslingers are only interesting as long as they continue to ask him riddles. Then Jake speaks up and tells Blaine not to release the gas. Jake is worried about the gas floating over to the town of River Crossing and killing all the old people. But instead of recognizing the terror in Jake's voice, Blaine begins to laugh, which reinforces the notion that, to Blaine, human life means nothing. As the story progresses, we return to the TikTok man's lair. The TikTok man is still lying on the floor and bleeding out profusely. Suddenly, he hears the man's voice, but assumes it's just his imagination. He prefers to reflect back on a childhood memory that reminds himself of better days. Then the TikTok man hears the voice again and looks up at the stranger in the room. The stranger turns out to be the man in black, but he's not dressed in his usual garb of black robes. He's wearing a short, dark jacket, faded denim trousers, and a pair of dusty boots. He looks more like a gunslinger than a wizard known for being evil incarnate. The man in black introduces himself as Richard Fannin, not one of his usual aliases such as Walter O'Dim, Martin Broadcloak, or what he's known by in other worlds, Randall Flagg. The man in black reaches out his hand to the TikTok man, and once the TikTok man grabs it, the throbbing pain inside of his head begins to subside. The man in black can see the instant relief from agony on the TikTok man's face, and then the man in black notices the bloody piece of scalp hanging from the side of the TikTok man's head. The man in black asks the TikTok man if that bothers him, and before he can answer the question, the man in black rips it clean off the TikTok man's head. The pain is excruciating, but once again, slowly goes away. Then the man in black tells the TikTok man, in order to show gratitude for saving his life, he wants his assistance in killing Roland and his fellow gunslingers. The TikTok man agrees, and they leave the city of Lud before the deadly gas can kill them both. Side note, this is what the man in black specializes in, reaching out to people at their lowest point and using their weakness to his advantage. Honestly, he's no different than a drug dealer, a lawyer, or a politician. Manipulation is a skill that the man in black has absolutely mastered, and he uses that skill like a surgeon uses a scalpel. And I'll say this as well. I still find it very odd that the man in black never attacks Roland himself. I mentioned this in my gunslinger review, that something prevents the man in black and Roland from directly harming each other. The Man in Black always works through other people to try and kill Roland, and Roland has had opportunities in the past to shoot the Man in Black dead, 
at point blank range, but his bullets never hit their mark. And this is despite the fact that Roland is a marksman. So there must be a reason why the powers that be prevent one from killing the other. But what that reason is, is something we may never know. As Roland and his Kotep begin their journey with Blaine, Blaine makes the inner walls of the train transparent so they can watch him murder the citizens of Lull. There is a purple colored gas that is released from the underground tunnels and upward through the city manholes. The Kotet looks on in horror as the gas overtakes the people of Lud like an animal captures its prey. Each victim screams in agony while at the same time clawing at their throats in a futile attempt to breathe some fresh air. Seeing all the death and destruction from the train above is like looking down into a window of hell. Eddie tells Blaine to return the walls to normal because he can't keep watching people get slaughtered. But Blaine does not respond and simply ignores Eddie's pleas, and the homicidal train continues to ride the rail along the path of the beam. As the story continues, Jake tells Blaine he knows why Blaine killed the people of Lud, and he also knows why Blaine decided to give them a ride across the wastelands. Jake says Blaine plans to commit suicide and is taking the last of the gunslingers with him. This causes Blaine to burst out into maniacal laughter, as if to say, you are correct and you should prepare yourself to die. Then Roland asks Blaine, why does he want to kill himself? Blaine responds again by saying he is bored, but then reveals that he's experiencing some sort of degenerative disease, which he believes is causing him to go insane. And since he's not able to repair the problem, he feels there's no reason for him to continue to exist. After making the suicidal confession, Blaine demands the Cotet ask him more riddles. If they refuse to do so, he won't wait to end their lives in Topeka. He'll kill himself and everybody on board the train right here and right now. Roland sees this as a challenge, no different than any other gunfight he'd been a part of in the past, except this time, instead of taking aim and firing several rounds of bullets, he would use his intellect and arsenal of riddles to combat this opponent. Roland answers Blaine by saying, fuck you, which is followed by several insults that would normally rip into a man's pride. But since Blaine is a machine, Roland says his words should have little effect on something that is nothing more than a mere gadget. Being called a mere gadget enrages Blaine to the point that he commands Roland to shut his mouth. Then Blaine once again threatens to kill everyone on the train. To this, Roland says, kill if you will, but command me nothing. Then Roland offers Blaine a proposal. Roland and his quartet will continue to ask Blaine riddles on their journey forward. And if Blaine solves every one of their riddles by the time they get to Topeka, then he may carry out his plan to kill them all. However, if the gunslingers ask a riddle that Blaine cannot solve, then he must take them to Topeka so they can pursue their quest. Blaine agrees, and the contest begins. My thoughts on this book are, I was much happier with this book than I was the drawing of the three, but it wasn't even close to touching the perfection of the Gunslinger book. I really liked Shardick and learning that he was some sort of Frankenstein creation of the great old ones. I really like meeting the people of River Crossing because they were a direct link to the midworld of old when gunslingers used to roam the land as protectors of the people and carried with them a sort of gravitas that was bigger than life. I thought Lud was interesting, but I really wasn't blown away by it. Since it was just a broken down version of modern day New York, I felt less interested in knowing about it. I found Blaine very interesting and I plan on giving a deeper analysis of him in my next review. And in regards to Roland's new quartet, I prefer Roland's old quartet. That was the group of gunslingers he ran with when he was a teenager. We'll learn more about them in the Wizard and Glass book. So overall, I will give this book a 3 out of 5. As we continue the journey, I'll be reviewing the fourth book in the Dark Tower series, Wizard and Glass. So until next time, goddammit.